So on that day, you'll realize that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. John 14, 20, um, union in Christ. John Calvin said, the mystery of being in Christ is by its nature incomprehensible. That's encouraging, isn't it? Thanks, John. And, uh, and by incomprehensible, he meant uh, unfathomable. He did not mean nonsensical. Unfathomable. We're never going to get to the bottom of this, certainly in this, in this age. But, uh, but boy, it's, it's exciting to explore, isn't it? The mystery of being in Christ. So far, we've thought about this. A God whose togetherness in community is so profound, he is one and he is three, invites us into his togetherness, and we share that togetherness together, in, in community together, with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And inevitably, if that's our experience, that is going to bring peace and love and joy. What, what else could it be? Uh, in, in the midst of a broken and sinful and struggling and uh, painful experience, Beneath all of that lies this deep-rooted, unmovable peace, love, and joy. If we remember to remember the togetherness, if, if, we, if we set our hearts and our minds on those cosmic and continuing and eternal realities, what else could it bring into our lives other than peace, joy, and love? And we will, we will experience that togetherness increasingly through humble, trusting obedience in the Lord Jesus Christ. It will, it will remain objectively true if we live trivial, silly, individualistic, selfish Christian lives. But if we, if we remember and if we humbly trust and obey our Lord Jesus Christ, we will have that experience of growing in our awareness and our understanding and our experience of just how abundant our life in the Lord Jesus is actually is. Now, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at a, a very familiar New Testament passage, and it's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through to 4, verse 6. And what I hope we're going to see tonight in just these few minutes before we, we close this evening is the way that the principles we see outlined in, in John 14, uh, John 13, 14, and 15, are evidenced and embodied and being lived out in the church in Ephesus, and therefore that will also be the case in our congregations, our ministries, our service groups as well. So, so let, let's jump in. And we're going to take this a verse at a time. So forgive me if this is a way of reading scripture that irritates you rather than a big chunk. But, uh, but let's just take it a verse at a time. And we're going to start by seeing how in Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians 3 verse 14 following, we see these, these John 14 principles being embedded, being expressed, being experienced by this early Christian community. Before we jump into that, whenever we see a f for this reason, it's good to check what the reason is, isn't it? And by the way, Martin, if you like um, yellow circles, you're going to love tonight. You're really going to love tonight. So, uh, so, f so for this reason, what, what's the reason? Well, back in verse 12, uh, he said this, In Christ Jesus our Lord, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Well, okay then for that reason, here's how I'm going to be praying for people who have that opportunity uh, in Christ and through faith in the Lord Jesus to approach the living God with freedom and confidence. Let's pray. Let's pray for one another if that is our reality. So for this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And you remember, we, we saw that the Son is in the Father and, and then we, we are shared, that lovely relational intimacy within the Godhead is shared with us, which is the idea that Paul communicates there, isn't he? Isn't it? I kneel before the Father from whom every family on heaven and on earth derives its name. You've probably got a little footnote in your Bible that says in the Greek, the word for family and the word for father sound very similar. So he's punning there. But the idea is we share the relational nature of our creator. That's what we read in John 14. And that's what Paul is reflecting here. One of the sadnesses of the last couple of years was, was, uh, was to lose Eugene Peterson, wasn't it? I don't know if you read the accounts of Eugene Peterson's passing, but it was, it was pretty vivid. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, he was slipping in and out of a, of a kind of dementia. And then towards his, his final days, his family reported that he was talking to people. And I think what he was doing was he was seeing people in paradise, 
and he was talking to them, and Eugene Peterson's last words were, let's go. Isn't that incredible? His last words, let's go. And, and he died. In, uh, in a long obedience in the same direction, Peterson says this, membership of the church is part of the fabric of redemption. God never makes private, secret salvation deals with people. No Christian is an only child. If God is my father, then this is my family. So, uh, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And we have seen already, haven't we, that John 14 emphasis, the spirit and the son make our lives their home. And we see just that principle being uh, explained again and experienced by the Ephesian church as Paul steers them through. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And we saw that the togetherness uh, that we share with one another and the Father, the Son, and the Spirit will inevitably bring the love and the joy and the peace of the living God into our hearts and our minds. That's the principle that we see mapped out in Paul's prayer to the Ephesians. And he goes on, and let's know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And we saw in John 14, uh, 23, that it's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit who come to make their home in us when we, we, we trust on the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for our eternal life. And that's the idea that Paul is expressing there. We're filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that, has work, that is at work within us, if this sounds awesome, if this, if, if this sounds almost too much, if this, if this feels so so distinct from the reality that we may be perceiving around us, let's remind us that this is God's work done in our midst by his power. He'll do more than we can ask or imagine, but it won't be dependent upon us. It'll be his power at work within us. I labor, Paul says, with all his energy that so powerfully works in me. And so therefore, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Churches living this reality have brought glory to God through the generations. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit in this verse, looks ahead, doesn't he? Uh, to glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. He pictures us, all those years hence, still living out these incredible and beautiful principles. So here's, here's how this passage proceeds into chapter 4. And as we read on, and we're going to finish with these tonight, I'm going to suggest we see four togetherness essentials. If that's the calling that we have received, if that, if that incredible prayer that Paul has mapped out that echoes those principles we saw in those beautiful realities that we saw in John 14, if this is the calling we've received to be a people like this, what will our role be? And in this passage, I think we see four togetherness essentials. So let's have a look as we, as, we, as we track through this. So Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So if we took those verses, how about this as our first togetherness essential? Shall we work to guard our own hearts I found um, Beth's prayer so moving, I, I actually wept when I had to acknowledge my own brokenness and my sinfulness in so many of those phrases that she was, uh, she was leading us in. Because verse 2 of Ephesians 4 has not always been true of me. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And particularly in times of division or disunity or, or difficulty, 
those are the moments where, I don't know about you, but I most have to guard my heart and lean into humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance through the inspiration and in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we had a, um, a, an incident in about this time last year, actually, maybe, maybe a little bit later. Uh, we, we were open. The college was open. We only had, we'd capped our numbers in consultation with Lancashire Public Health at 60 students. And we got them there, and we pretty much quarantined all of them for two weeks. And they were out. And the country was in lockdown. And, uh, and you could only go shopping for essential purposes. Now... Most of our students are, are brilliant, and occasionally we get students who, who come, although they're technically adults, they come a little bit immature. And we had last year two young American men, just turned 18, basically both still puppies. And, uh, and, and they took it into their minds one Sunday afternoon, just around about this time last year, when the only shopping you could do was essential shopping, and when we basically locked the place down and told the students they could not leave sight without permission unless it was essential because the risk of transmission was so high at that point. They took it into their minds to walk into Carnforth, the three miles into Carnforth, down the canal, and, uh, and go to Tesco's and buy, and bear in mind, we are a teetotal community at Cape and Ray, buy a litre of whiskey, a litre of gin, 18 cans of Stella, and four cans of Tanglefoot Ale. And, uh, and then they were gonna bring them back on site for, a, for an illicit drinks party. The problem was, they were served at the Tesco checkout in Carnforth by the mother of one of our staff members. <laughs> and American accents are not common in Carnforth. So you would probably assume it's a Cape and Ray student. And that impression was exacerbated by the fact that one of them was wearing his sweatshirt, his Cape and Ray hoodie. So uh, this Tesco um, checkout lady, mother, did what she probably shouldn't have done. And as they left her, her checkout, they took a photo she took a photograph of them. And then she took a photograph of the receipt and then she emailed them both to me. <laughs> and I was, happening, I was at my desk at the time, and I saw this, this come in on a Sunday afternoon. So I just, uh, a few minutes later, wandered to the gate and watched these two come in with a very heavy-looking rucksack and invited them into my office. And in, in those moments, in fact, before they arrived, I can remember reading this passage because I could feel all kinds of things rising in me. I could feel anger rising. I could feel injured pride rising. They had, they had disobeyed instructions that I personally had given the student body. They were threatening the integrity of, of the Bible school. I could feel a kind of anger rising in me. And I wanted to respond in that moment with humility and with as much gentleness as was appropriate in a situation that required a firm response, and with patience and with forbearance. And I had, a, I had no option. I did have to dismiss them but I hope I dismiss them in, in as, as gentle and loving and affirming a way as possibly I could have done in that situation. But I was aware of just how dangerous my heart can be in those kinds of moments, particularly in moments where I'm under pressure or I'm in opposition or I'm in division or disagreement with a brother or a sister. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient bearing with one another in love. I'd, I don't want to force any applications tonight. We, we've heard this superb presentation from Martin and from Beth, and, and let's just let God's word do its work without, without forcing anything. But whatever happens next in this network in terms, of, in terms of greater togetherness, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. We're very familiar probably with now with this quote from Keller's lovely little book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, which I find so helpful. He's riffing off C.S. Lewis. The thing we'd remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility isn't thinking more of myself or less of myself. It's thinking of myself less. Not because we're not worth thinking about, but because we're so worth thinking about that the Father gave the Son sent the Son to be an atoning sacrifice so that we could live. And if we're in him, the big battles in our lives have already been won. So, so we can afford to be gospel humble people, not grasping anything because we have everything we need in Christ already. 
So let's be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with each other in love. Here's our, our second togetherness essential from this passage. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So our, our second togetherness essential is this. We must expect togetherness to be hard work. I, I thought Martin's emphasis on, and we'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow morning, but Martin's emphasis on the evangelistic potential of Christian unity was brilliant. How often have you been to an evangelism training course and heard that, uh, that unity between believers is going to be evangelistically potent? I hardly ever hear that said in the context of, of evangelism. But this is how all people will know that you are my disciples, by the love you have one for another. So it's no wonder, is it, that Satan will be absolutely terrified of Christian unity. If it's going to be so evangelistically potent, will he not be throwing everything he possibly has at trying to break it? And how dumb are we to keep falling for that strategy? How dumb are we to keep allowing ourselves to be divided in ways that are actually going to water down and compromise our witness to a deeply lost and needy world? This is going to be a battle. Unity is going to be a battle. So let's expect it to be the case. Uh, I, I was greatly blessed, and I've mentioned him already this weekend, by the chair of our leadership team for many years. He was chair for over 25 years of Belmont, a very wise, wise man. And one of the things that Dave would do was, would be consistently on the lookout for where the emerging threats to unity at Belmont Chapel were coming from. He just had an antennae that was really carefully tuned to division because he knew to expect it and he knew that it would be an incredibly predictable tactic of the enemy. And we see it in the book of Acts, don't we? First major attack on the church is Acts chapter 4 when the Sanhedrin tell the apostles to stop preaching Christ. That, gets, that goes nowhere. Who are we going to listen to, God or you? Thank you, we're going to keep preaching Jesus. And what's the next attack on the church in the book of Acts? What happens in Acts chapter 5? Where does the attack come from internally? Ananias and Sapphira comes from inside. And it is entirely predictable that our unity will be under threat. We should not be surprised when these things happen. But we're going to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I, I wonder if that's one of our most ignored verses in the New Testament, whether we actually take that seriously. Are we going to work really hard at unity? Then there's one body and there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So here's our third togetherness essential. Shall we not honor the gospel by making it visible in our churches. So Paul explains that just the glorious uh, unity, the oneness of the good news that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one body of Christ on this earth. There is one Holy Spirit. There is only one hope for rescue from sin and death. There is only one Lord Jesus. There is one faith. There is one location where we put our trust for our salvation. There is only one baptism. There's one God and Father of all. It's oneness. So could we reflect the oneness of the gospel through the oneness of our fellowship? Is, is that going to be something that we could do? We honor the gospel by making it visible in our church. Now, it can never be unity at any cost, can it? It, it can't both be a gospel unity and unity at any cost. It has to be a unity within the boundaries of the gospel. And we'll discuss that a little bit more, particularly in, in the seminar tomorrow morning. But, but where that is possible, surely we can honor the gospel by making it visible in our church. Mark Dever, the Washington, D.C. pastor, in his book, The Church, he subtitles it, 
the gospel made visible. And he says this, Christian proclamation might make the gospel audible, but Christians living together in local congregations make the gospel visible. The church is the gospel made visible. We forgive as we have been forgiven. We love as we have been loved. We reconcile as we have been reconciled. Uh, people will look upon us and say, what, what is that they're patterning, that, conf- that repentance and that confession and that forgiveness and that reconciliation, the way a, a relationship between them is restored? Wh- where are they getting the resource to do that? Where are they getting the example to do that? Where are they getting the joy to do that? We make the gospel visible in our community. It will be a massive evangelistic tool, but we take it frequently, and I speak, for my, I speak for myself, and this may not be true of you, forgive me, but I don't take this anywhere near seriously enough. And here's our, our fourth and final togetherness essential. As Paul goes on, this is, this is in to chapter 4 and verse 7, to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it, and then he goes into a discussion about gifts, a brief discussion about spiritual gifts. Uh, And then verse 11, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So there is a diversity in the church, there's a diversity in the gifts that God has given his people. There are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and the, all the other gifts that are mentioned in the other four lists of gifts, gifts in the New Testament. And that diversity is given not for the sake of division, it's given for the sake of interdependence. It's given so that we may recognize we need each other, that the variety of gifts, the variety of ministries, the variety of skill sets and passions are given so that I need you and you need me. And if we're going to reach this lost world, we're going to have to work together to to make that effective so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And we grow up we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So our our very difference should be strengthening unity and gospel potency. That's the message of, of all of the teaching about the spiritual gifts in the New Testament. So for gospel, for togetherness essentials, let's guard our hearts Let's expect togetherness to be hard work. Let's honor the gospel by making it visible in our church communities. And let's use the the God-given and beautiful diversity that we see uh, just in this room tonight to strengthen our unity. We mentioned Peterson earlier. Here's Peterson again. Same book long obedience. He says this, every day I put love on the line. There is nothing I am less good at than love. I am far better in competition than love. I'm far better at responding to my instincts and ambitions to get ahead and make my mark than I am at figuring out how to love another. I am trained and schooled in acquisitive skills in getting my own way. And yet I decide every day to set aside what I can do best and attempt what I do very clumsily. Open myself up to the frustrations and the failures of loving, daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. We have a God whose togetherness in community is so profound that he's one and he's three, who invites us into his togetherness. We share that togetherness together. It brings inevitably peace and love and joy. We have to, though, remember to remember it. We must experience it increasingly through humble, trusting obedience in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's a togetherness that will need a humility and a gentleness. It's a togetherness that will need work to sustain. And it's a togetherness that will be built on diversity. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the way uh, you have been moving in so many lives in this movement over so many, so many years, so much transformation, so many rescued lives, all, all that, that incredible uh, work that we've been seeing reflected in the reports from the different agencies. Thank you too, Father, for, for Martin's reminder that we live uh, in a dark corner of your world spiritually. And Lord, we, we long to grow in our gospel effectiveness and we long to make the gospel visible. Would you be speaking to each of us as individuals? Would you be speaking to us as church leaders? Would you be speaking to us as service groups and as ministries to see how we're going to be doing that and go from strength to strength in the way we show the world who you are and we show the world just how, how heart-grabbingly lovely you are. May our communities uh, bring great glory to you. And we pray these things in the precious and lovely name of Jesus. Amen.